So today we're going to unlock mysteries of the universe as we delve into three strange and surprising mathematical discoveries that are going to challenge everything that you thought you knew about maths, from the Monty Hall problem, which is a right brain scratcher, to the Nash equilibrium, to the idea that, well, maths might not actually be real, this video is going to take a journey through the unexpected and the unknown. Join us as we explore how maths can prove something about the physical world without the need for an experiment. Yep, <laughs> it's confusing. And like I said, is it even real? So we're going to start out with one that's fairly easy to understand if you have it explained to you. Imagine you're on a game show. The presenter points to three curtains on the stage and says, behind each of these curtains is a prize. One of the prizes is a million dollars, another is a thousand dollars, and the last one is a banana. Your task is to pick the curtain with the million dollar prize so you can take home the jackpot. Now, which of these curtains do you choose? Now let's suppose that you pick curtain number one. However, instead of showing you what's behind curtain number one, the game show host cheekily decides to give you a free look at what's behind curtain number three. He reveals that concealed behind curtain number three is a thousand dollars. This means that one of the two remaining curtains conceals a million dollars and the other one is hiding a banana. And now the host asks you another question. Do you want to stick with your original choice of curtain number one or would you like to switch your choice to curtain number two? So one of these curtains hides a million dollars. The other one hides a banana. What are you going to choose? Well, give it a moment because you really do want to consider your answer here. Now, common everyday intuition is going to contradict the right answer right now. While most people, when asked whether they want to change their choice, they're going to stick with their original guess. We have a tendency to favor the decisions we've already made, even when new information becomes available. You reason that you have a 50-50 shot of being right, so you're going to stick with curtain number one. And if you made that choice, I'm sorry, but you're actually making the wrong choice because it's not 50-50, it's 66.6 .6 and 33.3. .3. If you had changed your choice to curtain number two, your chances of being right would have risen to 66%. But, well, how is this possible? It makes no sense. I hear you all typing in the comment section. Now, this is the Monty Hall problem, named after the host Monty Hall of Let's Make a Deal. He often employed this trick in the show. Is it behind door number one, or door number two, or door number three? The problem, according to probability experts, is that we have a hard time understanding probabilities when the base assumptions of the situation change. In this scenario, you begin with a third chance of getting the correct curtain on the first try. Simple enough. But when a second curtain, never the curtain you originally guessed, is opened, the probabilities change. While your original guess still has a third chance of being correct, the other remaining curtain now has a two-third chance of being the right one. What has to be kept in mind is that the curtain the host shows you isn't the one you picked. If the host had revealed the curtain you picked to show that it contained a banana and then asked you to choose from one of the other curtains, you would have a 50-50 chance of getting it right. Now, if you're still confused at this point, don't worry, we'll explain a little bit more. I also need a little bit of help. To demonstrate this more clearly, let's imagine a scenario where there are 100 curtains, 99 of which contain bananas, and only one curtain which contains a million dollars. You pick a random curtain, say number 67. Now imagine the host opens 98 of the other curtains only to reveal bananas. Now only your curtain, 67, and let's say curtain 81 are closed. Do you change your choice this time? Now the problem probably makes more intuitive sense to you. The chances of you picking 67 correctly on the first try was 1 in 100. The chances of number 81 being the correct curtain are 99 out of 100. You can try this yourself at home using a set of playing cards, trying to guess which of three cards is an ace. You'll find that when one of the other options is removed, changing your choice works more often than not. It's pretty crazy, isn't it? It does kind of blow my mind. I still like... How is it changing? But it's maths. Despite it playing a central part in the Academy Award winning film A Beautiful Mind, amazing movie. The concept of the Nash equilibrium is never really explored in the film, aside from a sort of lame example about the chaps in a pub getting dates with a hot blonde. And that's really too bad, not to mention that it's a needlessly sexist example that was insulting to the audience, but well, that's for another video. Because far better than helping nerds get laid, some very smart people believe that this discovery might have actually saved 
the world. Perhaps it was because the film's creators thought the mathematics behind Nash's discoveries involving game theory were too abstract to be dealt with in depth in a film that is really about an emotional journey of a brilliant man who suffers from debilitating schizophrenic episodes. Or perhaps the truth seemed a little too frightening. For a Hollywood film. But when you look into it, the Nash Equilibrium is actually a fascinating and fairly easy to comprehend principle of game theory that can help us to understand how many systems of the modern world function. It explains, for example, how we can use machine learning based AIs to train other AIs to win at chess. It also helps explain much deeper problems of society, such as the efforts to lower carbon emissions or to reduce nuclear armaments. Maths is kind of amazing. In its simplest form, the Nash Equilibrium Theory proposes that there exist scenarios in game theory as well as in the real world where all competing participants who know the optimal strategies of all other participants have no incentive to unilaterally change their own standing in order to win an advantage over the others. We'll use the example of the coordination game, which is a two-participant game or common everyday situation in which two people have a similar goal but must make strategic decisions that depend on the other person making a similar choice. Now, imagine two cars driving down a one-lane road in opposite directions. Let's assume, in each case, that there's no way for the cars to avoid hitting each other unless both swerve in opposite directions, both going to the right from the perspective of each car. This is a Nash equilibrium in that there exists a universal binary choice that both participants must adopt for both to be equally successful. If either player changes their strategy, then both are going to lose. While this may seem like a common sense idea, when it is applied to a more complex system, the Nash equilibrium theory reveals that there often exist situations in which it is better to inform all the participants of the ideal strategies for everyone in order for everyone to follow the best strategy and equally benefit from the outcome. So why does this matter? Let's imagine you're one of two cars driving down this one-way street and there's enough room on the street for one of the cars to swerve out of the way while the other simply continues driving. In game theory, this is called a mixed strategy. In this case, while there is an extremely minor benefit in time and effort saved to the person who barrels straight ahead without swerving, it severely reduces the chances of a successful outcome for both parties since both cars have the potential to make the same decision to not swerve. By making both drivers aware of their own responsibility to make room for each other as a matter of social convention, we ensure that all such situations result in successful outcomes for everybody. Now look, this may seem like obvious common sense today, but there was actually a time in which governments did not fundamentally realize that driver education and roadway conventions were an essential part of public safety. We now use these principles to design traffic laws along with innumerable other systems involving different participants who must make choices. In places where the Nash equilibrium is not being applied, other ad hoc strategies can arise that significantly endanger the public. For example, at certain times and places, it was actually the convention for the larger car or horse to be given room by the smaller car or horse. But this creates certain problems, as no two parties have perfect information. What if I think my car is bigger than yours when it's actually not? Or what if our cars are the same size? Now imagine that we aren't discussing cars driving down a street, but instead, we're talking about countries building nuclear weapons. In a real-world scenario where different countries are building world-ending weapons, there exists a Nash equilibrium in which the participant countries gain all the benefits of being armed with nuclear weapons without, you know, ending the world. In order to achieve that equilibrium, it is required that all participants be aware of the ideal strategy for all other participants and that there be no advantages possible from failing to follow that strategy. It breaks down if one of the countries can break those rules and get an advantage. Nash's theorem helped nuclear strategy theorists to realize that the ideal approach to nuclear proliferation was to allow one's geopolitical enemies to know exactly what kinds of weapons one was developing, and once a country had developed nuclear weapons, to allow those weapons to exist without interference. As long as all countries maintain a doctrine of non-first use, meaning that they would only consider using their nukes in response to a nuclear attack, then the nuclear powers are in a default Nash equilibrium with each other. This is why geopolitical strategists care so much more about rogue states getting nukes than they do about established countries having them. Established countries are educated as to the ideal nuclear strategy and are not going to choose to violate the doctrine because it just doesn't confer any advantage to them. 
In addition, knowledge of the Nash equilibrium helps us make planning decisions. For example, it helps in the development of the induced demand theory of public infrastructure, whereby the addition of new lanes on a highway actually creates worse traffic problems than decreasing the number of lanes on the same highway. To grossly oversimplify, by providing people with choices, we actually cause them to make overall worse decisions that impact everybody negatively. And that's not just a discovery that affects traffic patterns, it may also have saved the world. In the 1950s, following the perfection of tritium-fueled neutron bombs, the Soviet Union discovered to their surprise that there turned out to be no theoretical limit to the payload size of a tritium bomb. This realization, though it conferred a strategic advantage, actually led the Soviet Union to abandon further testing of the technology and possibly even to quietly inform the United States, by way of known spies within the USSR, of the potential for tritium bombs to destroy the world. This was because Soviet and American strategists realized that having such bombs would upset the Nash equilibrium of the nuclear powers. Like adding lanes to a highway, adding bombs to the arsenal uh, would have led to decisions that benefited nobody. For over 60 years, the true potential of tritium bombs was not known to the public, but Soviet and American leaders were aware of it, and more importantly, they chose to ensure that the other was also aware. In this way, paradoxically, the race to build greater and greater nuclear weapons actually ended just as it had begun, with both sides adopting an ideal strategy not to play the game at all. So look, maybe you've uh, smoked a little too much pot one time and been like, dude, what if maths isn't even real, man? <laughs> well, look, have no fear. Even professional mathematicians have been there without the aid of THC. Mathematician and physicist Eugene Wigner, huge stoner, just, just joking, I have no idea he is, <laughs> made the observation in a 1960 paper titled The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. To quote, It is important to point out that the mathematical formulation of the physicist's often crude experience leads in an uncanny number of cases to an amazingly accurate description of a large class of phenomena. What we lament more broadly is that when one considers that numbers and equations on paper, which are human concepts that only symbolically represent actual things in the real world, can actually be used to make concrete predictions with a stunning degree of accuracy, is, well, just a little strange. He continued, The miracle of appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. We should be grateful for it and hope that it will remain valid in future research and that it will extend for better or worse to our pleasure, even though perhaps also to our bafflement, to wide branches of learning. Wigner was not arguing that maths is not somehow representative of the real world according to our own experience, but rather pointing out that there is no fundamental reason why the constants and laws of the universe should be possible to express in written formulas in the first place. He was also pointing out that it's still very much possible that the way we conceive the laws of mathematics is fundamentally limited by the way we think and use symbolic representations of reality to theorize and draw conclusions. If we have proved a scientific fact using maths alone, have we really made a discovery at all? A simpler way of thinking about this problem is to ask that question most of us have pondered at some point in childhood. What if the color red looks red to me, but to everyone else it looks like what I think of as blue? How could I ever prove that everyone else sees the same red that I see if I can only use the color itself as a representative symbol of what I see? The same is true of mathematics. If maths can prove something about the physical world that we can't actually test, then has it really been proved? Computer scientist Richard Hamming expanded on Wigner's ideas in the 1980s, proposing that a number of fundamental discoveries of science did not come from observation, but were rather discovered through maths and only later roughly confirmed with observations. He points out Galileo's discovery of the law of falling bodies, the fact that, all else being equal, everything falls at the same velocity, and it was not actually possible to derive this purely from experiments. Instead, Galileo envisioned artificial scenarios in which the conditions were precisely controlled, and it was these imagined experiments that actually proved his theory, not the real world. It is in the fact that no perfect experiment, no all else being equal scenario is ever actually possible, that we must consider that maths alone provides the proof of many of our ideas about the universe. But maths is just symbols, it's not reality. How could we prove it was if no scenario is ever controlled in every possible way? In essence, 
Maths is perfect, but real life is not. Now, if we go a little bit further with this idea, we find that very often, experiments that seem to prove mathematical laws are never actually as perfect as the maths itself. There often remains a possibility, however slight, that the reality isn't exactly what the math says it is. And historically, this has been true for some pretty important discoveries. Newtonian physics, for example, was mathematically proven in the 17th century, but it was not until the 20th century that our observations proved it wasn't actually the whole truth. Einsteinian physics showed that Newtonian physics was incomplete. The maths was perfect. Reality wasn't. The same will probably be true for Einsteinian physics thanks to quantum physics, yet even quantum physics may one day prove to be incomplete. Schrodinger's cat is famously both dead and not dead because that is what maths tells us. But we don't actually know that for sure. Just like I can't be sure that my blue is your blue, I can't prove the Schrodinger equations using an experiment. And yet, at the end of the day, this may not be something you actually need to worry about. The more complex the mathematics, the less often it has an impact on our daily lives. The theory of relativity may be necessary to program satellites, but it's probably not important for you on your drive to work. Newtonian physics might be important for designing a building, but it's not important to someone working in one. For most purposes, the human brain understands reality as we experience it, without the need for any abstract symbols or mathematical concepts. You don't need to know calculus in order to throw a baseball, even if you would need calculus to understand the baseball's movement. Your brain does all of this without any maths. So sit back, relax, and know that everything's going to be fine, even if maths isn't even real. Thanks for watching.